And the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind upon the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Let's pray. God, I pray that your spirit that precedes us, that is here in the space, would fill each of us up, that we might receive what it is that you have for us and are sent out to serve you. Amen. So I'm not a big Black Friday shopper. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I have never actually gone and waited in a line for a store to open or done the whole Black Friday thing. But I I do love a sale. So I love online shopping. Uh, the idea that I could get some of my Christmas shopping done a few days ago while things were on sale from the comfort of my home Uh, was just hard to resist. And so I made a few orders, and here is what happened. And here's what happens every time you go online shopping. I know you're familiar with this, too. You get an email as soon as you've placed the order that says, order placed. And then, like, later that day, a few hours, a few days later, you get another email that says, order fulfilled. Well, here's the thing. I don't have the package yet. In my mind, the order is not fulfilled because I equate fulfillment with completion. And I get that email that's like order fulfilled. And I think like, holy moly, that was fast. But of course, what they mean is that the order has been taken off of some shelf in some warehouse, put into a box, had a label slapped on it, and then it's UPS's problem, right? It's been fulfilled by whatever company I've ordered it from. We tend to think of order fulfillment being something that happens when it's all completed. We're in the season of Advent right now. Today marks the beginning of the season of Advent. It comes from the Latin Adventus, which means the coming or the arrival. It's the time that we look back not just to when Jesus came, the birth of Jesus, but also the fulfillment, the coming of all things that God has promised. All of what God has ahead for us, the things that God wants to do in the world And the ways in which those are being fulfilled even now. So look, we see glimpses of of people being healed. We see glimpses of relationships that are restored. We see glimpses of hope in the world around us. They may not be perfect yet. But because we can hang on to what we know that God does. Because we know that God's promises will be fulfilled. We know that that package is coming. We know that it is all coming to us. These promises are love and hope and peace and joy. And so each week in Advent, we are going to talk about how God prophesied those things would come to us and then how they get fulfilled now through Jesus Christ. I wonder how many of us are waiting on this package of hope. Right, Ashley just read this text and it talks about good news for the poor and the oppressed and release for the captives. And upon first reflection, I am sure that there are a lot of us that think, I'm not oppressed, I'm not a captive, I'm not poor. But wisdom tells us that you could barely scratch the calm looking outer surface of anyone's life without finding that they have enough heartbreak and pain in their own life to bring you to tears. I think so many of us feel, especially at this point in the year, like our flame is just kind of burning out, right? We're exhausted. We miss people that we love deeply that are gone. We struggle to go to our offices in the morning because we don't like our boss. We wake up with the exact same Pains and frustrations every single day. And it feels like this is how it is always going to be. We are caught in this like can't and won't and don't and didn't trap. And it is into this that Advent comes. 
In a Christmas sermon in 1928, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, The celebration of Advent is possible only for those of us who are troubled in soul, who know ourselves to be poor and imperfect, who look towards something greater to come. For us, it's enough to wait until the Holy One himself comes down to us, God in the child in the manger. Why is it enough for us to wait until the Holy One comes down? It's because we know that we're waiting for this hope that isn't just some far off hope, but is happening now around us. There is an inbreaking of hope even now in our lives that says things will and can be different. So what is this hope? Let's start there. In the Hebrew, the word hope um, comes from two words are used for it, yakal and kava. And they have both this sense of like expectation and tension with them, right? So even the word kava has the same root word as the word cord. And you think about like a cord, when you pull it taut, it has tension in the cord. And so when we hope, we're hoping with that same sense of like tension and expectation. And, and in the New Testament, the Greek word has a sense of an outstretched hand. We hope with an outstretched hand. And so it's like um, a relay runner, right, that leans forward to grab the baton from the other person that's running. We, we hope in an active way. It's not this like head bowed, hands together, just sit there and wait for something to happen to us hope. It is an active hope that expects that something would be different. In all of these cases, we have that expectation because we know that what God says will be true. And we can wait with anticipation and expectation for that something that we know is going to be true. Now, look, this is different than the kind of hope that I think we have in the world for so many other things, okay? So I I hope that at some point in middle age, I will still become 5'9". I have hoped that since I was like 12 years old. It's my deepest hope. I'm not buying clothes for a 5'9 person, okay? I'm already deluding myself to buy clothes for a 5'5 person. So I don't hope for that in a way that's like, I really think that's going to come true, so I'm going to start to center my life on that. I, I hope that I'll win the lottery one day. I don't shape my life in a way that says, you know, I'm going to win the lottery. But I can lean forward in hope in my relationships and in the world that I live in, in the work that I do and in my day-to-day life with gospel hope because God promises us something that will happen, that will come true. So what is it that we're hoping for? It was right there in that passage from Isaiah that we just read. It was preached to the Israelites after they had returned from their captivity in Babylon. They had been taken away. Jerusalem and their entire homeland had been destroyed and turned to rubble. And they had had to live away for 80 years. And then they came back. But this isn't right after they come back. Here's what's interesting. Isaiah is not preaching to them as they return and they look at the rubble and they're devastated by it. No, it's, it's years later, maybe 20, 30, 40 years later. They have some semblance of a temple rebuilt and kind of return to life as normal, but it's nothing like it was before. There's no glory and there's no splendor. And so their lives are like, okay, or okay-ish. And I wonder how many of us have that similar feeling, right? That we feel um, defeated and pained by our okay-ish life. Things aren't terrible. They just haven't quite worked out the exact way we thought, or we're still waiting on them to work out in a certain way. And that's what God is speaking into. Look, when the Israelites grieved, when they were mournful or repentant or um, or with sadness about something, they put ashes on their foreheads. And so Isaiah says to them that instead of ashes, there's going to be something new. They're going to have a crown of beauty Look, some other translations have this as a crown of garland, like the crown that was given to a victor after they won a race. They get to win that and be victors. And he's saying this rubble that is your life that's okay-ish is not how it's always going to be. God is going to take this and make something new out of it. God, God can make you a victor. God will make you 
a victor. And then there's two other insteads. One of them is that they will receive this oil of joy instead of mourning. They'll receive a spirit of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They are going to be people who are going to be transformed with a glass half full mentality, one of praise, a place where they didn't think they had the capacity for that beforehand. Let me be frank. Even as I am speaking to you right now, even as I am sharing this, I can think of relationships in my life that feel like they are just past broken, that I don't, I don't know how they would ever look different. I have experiences that I can think on that I wish that I could redo and that I can't redo. And there are days when it just all feels fatalistic. Like, is this the best it's ever going to be? In these areas of my life, is it ever going to get better? Is it, I mean, you know, there's, there's been some healing and some scarring, so it's okay-ish. But it's like, this is, this is it? The Israelites felt that way too. Can you imagine how it felt for them to hear from Isaiah the insteads? It's not all that it's ever going to be. This isn't the end of the road for you. This isn't the last word on the relationship that you have, the gulf between a child or a spouse. This isn't the last word on your career or your job. There's something more. There is something new. It would have been completely mind-blowing for them. And, and what, what Isaiah is saying to them, what the word of Isaiah is saying to us too, is that this comes from God. Because we can't get to the insteads on our own. We have tried, Lord knows, we have tried to get to the insteads on our own. We have tried to pick up the pieces. We have tried to rebuild our lives. We have tried to do things of our own strength and our own power to turn things around. And there are just things that we can't turn around. And God can turn them around. And so the promise, the fulfillment is in Jesus Christ, in God made flesh who comes to turn them around for us. When Jesus came and began his ministry, the very first sermon that he preached was in his hometown of Nazareth. And he chose this text, this scroll of Isaiah, that we now know as Isaiah 61. And he preached it and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me and I have come to proclaim release to the captives, good news for the poor, recovery of sight for the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, to give comfort to those who mourn, The year of the Lord's Jubilee is upon us. Jesus proclaimed these things that we can hope in now because he said them, because we know that they will be fulfilled, are already being fulfilled, and will continue to be fulfilled. That's where we can pin our hopes. Right? He said, I will come to proclaim Um, to bind up the brokenhearted. At first pass, I think that that might sound to a lot of us like comfort for those who mourn. But he says that a few verses later. Why would he say both of those things? I'm going to suggest that those are different. That comforting those who mourn is not binding up our broken hearts. That our broken hearts is about something more spiritual. That we have hearts that are broken by our sin, by others' sin, by the effects of it. That 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 needs to be healed in a way that we can't heal ourselves. One of the things that I do at night is I practice the examine. So this is the prayer practice that I do at night, and it's a tool that was developed by St. Ignatius. And it's basically a way to reflect on your day, to look back at your day um, with God and to look ahead to tomorrow. And it asks you all the way through to pay attention to your emotions. And as other emotions come up, that's what you focus on and you reflect on. And then you can pray through those things. And I will tell you that on days that I know that I am consumed by pettiness or pride or gossip or greed or um, jealousy, that my heart is just broken And I don't mean in a sad way. I mean like in a, I don't know how to get the pieces back together to feel whole because right now I just feel like I am in pieces. And I know that that is what God can do for me. And know that is what Jesus has come to do is to put me back together by grace. The scripture says that he has come to proclaim good news to the poor. And at first pass, I think that 
for a lot of us, we don't really relate to that sense of material poverty that Jesus might have been speaking into, the not knowing where their next meal came from. But there's other translations that say good news for the afflicted or the oppressed or the meek, the humble. I think so many of us could use those words to describe our spiritual life, right? We might be spiritually poor at times. And Jesus has come to help those of us that can't help ourselves. He says something that's actually not in the Isaiah text. He says he's come to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. And we see over and over in Jesus' ministry where he does that, right? He heals the man that is born blind from birth at Bethsaida and John. He heals blind Bartimaeus and um, also in Mark, he heals the man at the pool of Siloam of their blindness, but he also heals those that are spiritually blind, right? You think about Nicodemus who came to Jesus under the cover of night and then spoke up for him when he was being um, tried and then eventually took his body and buried him and he was a Pharisee. We think of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, all of these people who experience recovery from their spiritual blindness. That is what Jesus does for us as well. Let me paint a picture for you of what I mean by this. So last week, we spent a few days in Baton Rouge with my family for Thanksgiving. And we have something in Houston that they don't have in Baton Rouge. We have light pollution in Houston. So there are no stars in my backyard. I've, I've never seen them. I can't see them. I don't know if there's stars in Houston. This might be just like a part of the Earth's universe that doesn't have stars in it. But when you go to Baton Rouge and you walk out in the backyard and you look up, it's just like this ceiling. It's like all of these lights, just stars everywhere, right? Now look, do I think there's really not stars in Houston? No, of course there are. But they're covered by the lights from the medical center and they're covered by clouds and they're covered by all of the light pollution that we have where our house is in our backyard. And so I can't see them. I am blind to the stars because there is something in front of it. Jesus peels back the scales on our eyes. It's like peeling back that light pollution so we can see what was always there. And so our, our scales are things like whether or not we're married There are things like how nice our house is or um, if we are physically attractive or what our job title is. Those are all the scales that we can see. And then Jesus peels them back and behind it, we see that our worth was never defined by those things. That our happiness was never meant to be defined by those things. That there is something more for us that we can hope in because we know that there is a truth greater than just this tunnel vision that we have put on ourselves. Jesus gives us recovery of our sight, our true sight. We have to lean into that. We have to be open to it. If we wanted to, we could just keep putting scales back over our eyes. We could remain spiritually poor. We could be brokenhearted. There are days when all of that seems easier than letting ourselves be open to God working in us. But that's the hope. The hope is that God will work in us, that there will be something new. A few weeks ago, someone became a billionaire almost overnight when they won the Powerball. The Powerball had been going for like three months. It was up to $2 billion, and the lump sum payment was somewhere around a billion dollars. I did not buy a ticket that time, which I would like to blame on the fact that I have a one and five year old that distract me. Um, But I have before bought lottery tickets and it's fun, right? You've bought them and you play that game of like, I wonder what I would do with a billion dollars, you know? I wonder what would be different in my life. I wonder what I would spend it on other than, you know, paying down the debt on the capital campaign or whatever it is, right? So there there is a sense that, that we can look at the gospel with this same type of wonder and hope. There's a pastor, Jennifer Mills Knutson, that says this, Powerball hope is different than gospel hope, but it opens us up to thinking about the gospel with the same kind of wonder. Just like it's fun to imagine what we do with a newfound fortune, it's fun to hope and imagine what we would do with the gospel too. As we enter this season of Advent, it is my prayer that we look with hope toward what God is doing and that we trust in it because this is not Powerball hope. This isn't grow to five foot nine in middle age life hope. This is gospel hope. This is hope that we can bank on because we know that God is already making all things new. God has already restored relationships and 
brought recovery of sight and binded up our broken hearts and brought us comfort when we're mourning, and God will continue to do that. And so instead of turning inward, we turn outward, and we, we unclench our fist, and we release ourselves to what God is doing, and we lean into that hope, the hope that we know will catch us, that we can trust that things are going to be made different and new in this season and always. Let's pray. Jesus, we are, we are just humbled to our knees by the fact that you came for us. That when things were the worst and the hardest, that you didn't abandon us, but that you just swept right in to set things right again. And we're humbled that you continue to do that in our lives. That it's not up to us that the chasms that we feel like we can't cross, you will cross with us and for us and that we might follow in your grace. And so I pray that you would open us up to seeing where it is that we need to lean into hope and trust in the work that you're doing and how we might be a part of it as well. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.